Thanks for your interest. The following is a comprehensive talk about bariatric surgery with Dr. John Pilcher. So thanks for checking in. Um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, surgery for morbid obesity. That's uh, surgery to treat weight problems and health problems that go with excess weight. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to introduce you to the group. Uh, there are five surgeons in this, in this group. Uh, I am the old one, uh, but I have four partners who are wonderfully trained and who we operate with all the time and uh, who also I would trust to operate on my wife, my family, or myself. And so um, one key point about that is that uh, when you choose this group, you're not just choosing a surgeon, you're choosing a team. And you're not just choosing the two surgeons that will be in your operation, but you're choosing uh, well-educated and well-trained nurses, um, respiratory therapists, hospitals that have the right kind of equipment, operating teams, and all those pieces are gonna come together. Um, also, just because you're watching me talking right now, I want you to trust that you certainly can um, coordinate with uh, the, the staff to get with any of the other surgeons. Perhaps uh, Dr. Seeger operated on your friend from work, or uh, you like Dr. Rice because she is a female surgeon and you feel more comfortable with that. Or maybe you like to have your clinic appointments on Mondays, which is when Dr. Stegeman works. Um, or maybe you think Dr. Duperior is cute, which seems to be a pretty common perception and uh, so you'll choose him. And all those are very good, reasonable choices. And I want you to trust that any of those surgeons that you choose um, are gonna do a great job for you. Now I do wanna tell you a little bit about this team in addition to what I just said. Um, first of all, I'd like to let you know, I'm very proud to say that our surgical program is a certified center of excellence for bariatric surgery. And that's actually a unique designation that means something. Center of Excellence is set up uh, by an external review organization that comes in and looks at the whole program. It looks at the surgeons and their experience and their operation technique and their outcomes. And it also looks at the hospital. It looks at the facilities. Um, you know, for example, is the CAT scanner large enough to handle an obese patient? And it looks at the training programs that the staff have going on, everything ranging from treatment of breathing problems to patient sensitivity as it relates to obesity and associated problems. So Center of Excellence is a real deal that we're very proud of and it really will make a physical impact for you and uh, your course and your outcomes with the surgery. One other unique feature of the practice that I touched on briefly a second ago is that every operation that we do is done actually by two surgeons in the practice. Now, what does that mean? It means that first of all, the surgeon that you sit down with and you meet is going to be your surgeon doing your operation, okay? For myself, for example but that surgeon is going to be assisted by one of the partners who also does this kind of operation on a regular basis, day in and day out. What happens with that is that you've got not only two sets of hands, but two sets of eyes and two experienced brains working on your case. So ideally, we can keep out of trouble, first of all, or if we have some problem during surgery, we're gonna be more able to handle that because of the coordinated efforts that we have both as experienced surgeons. Talking a little bit more about the quality of the program and the Center of Excellence perspective, um, as we go through this talk, I'm going to mention in several places outcomes and, and rates of problems and rates of weight loss and death rates and terrible things like that. Um, I want to just let you know at the outset that in each of these situations, our program matches and in lots of cases exceeds the national standards and the national averages, um, especially as it relates to mortality rates and the chances of blood clots going to the lungs. Uh, we are ahead of the curve on that and quite proud of it. So to talk about morbid obesity, we need to use a term called body mass index. And body mass index, or BMI, is a calculation that combines height and weight so that we can use one number to talk about um, how big a person is or how overweight they are. And we need this number because we talk about different levels of body mass index, or BMI, where a person has different risks related to the weight. Okay, and just for example, if you refer to the slide, you'll see a patient who has a body mass index of 44. That's my own patient before surgery. And, uh, and then we also have a picture of the same patient about a year and a half after her gastric bypass. And this is pretty much what a body mass index of 26 looks like. Now we like to talk about what the body mass index means at these different levels. 
Um, and people are familiar with the term, mostly, called a so-called ideal body weight. And an ideal body weight goes with a BMI between 20 and 25. Um, that's the level where if a person grows into that, they are the healthiest. That means they live the longest and have the lowest chance of uh, weight-related problems or the lowest chance of any medical problem. Statistically, it's demonstrated that when people get to a BMI greater than 30, they are beginning to see some definite increase in medical problems that are related to, caused by the weight. When people get to a body mass index greater than 40, it's generally agreed that most people are going to benefit from something extreme like surgery for weight loss. Now between 30 and 40 is a gray zone we can talk about more later. When people get to a body mass index greater than 60, the weight loss is really hurting them. And also the risk of surgery is increased when the body mass index goes above 60. And that doesn't mean that we can't do surgery at that level, but it means that the surgeon is going to have a different risk discussion with that patient as they get ready for surgery. I said earlier that um, bariatric surgery is for treatment or maybe prevention of serious medical problems. I want to talk about a couple of these in a little bit more extent. The first one is obstructive sleep apnea. Now almost everybody who thinks about having this surgery, in fact 80 or 90 percent of people thinking about bariatric surgery have sleep apnea. But it's very underdiagnosed because this is not something that primary doctors can test while a patient is sitting in their office. So the way sleep apnea shows up is that people commonly have snoring at night when they're trying to sleep. And this is usually the kind of snoring that people around them will complain about. This snoring comes from the fact that the fatty tissues constrict the airway or cause it to collapse down when a person is asleep. And by the way, it doesn't matter when you're upright during the day, but when you lay down at night, the airway collapses down and people actually physically have a hard time moving air. And when they have a hard time moving air, they don't get good sleep because they have to wake up to try to breathe a little bit. Usually they don't know that they wake up, but it's a poor sleep quality. And they have low oxygen levels that put a bad type of stress on the heart and lungs. And so sleep apnea is one of the conditions that we often recommend gets tested and if necessary treated before we will undertake surgery because treating sleep apnea will help the person be stronger and more resilient for the surgical procedure. Now there are a number of other medical conditions that very commonly go with excess weight that people pretty much recognize and those are diabetes and high blood pressure and heartburn reflux, some people call it GERD for short, where acid comes up, and joint problems, especially the knees and the ankles. All these things are very likely to improve as the weight comes down in one way, shape, or form. Now, I've been talking about how important it is to treat weight and how important it is to bring the weight down because the weight causes medical problems and damage. Um, so before we jump into surgery, let's just talk briefly about what else is available to uh, try to bring the weight down. And um, there are a number of things. There's, there's diet. Uh, you can diet on your own or with the help of a doc. You can go on Weight Watchers or Ornish or South Beach or Atkins. Uh, you can do Optifast, Metafast. Uh, you can take a variety of medications for weight loss. You can do um, psychological therapy. You can do acupuncture. You can go to a fat farm and spend a few weeks there. You can go on the TV show, The Biggest Loser. All those things will cause you to lose some weight. Cool thing, right? But as people know who are listening to me right now, the usual experience, in fact, the nearly universal experience after this is that people regain weight plus a bonus, right? So most of my patients have lost 500 pounds in the course of their life, but they've gained 600 or 650, okay? The key thing is substantial and sustained weight loss. And right now in America in the late 2000s, 2007 as I speak, there is not any treatment other than surgery that causes significant sustained weight loss. So, bad news, good news. You've already been to the bad news, these things don't work. The good news is that it actually was not your fault. This massive weight problem is a biological issue. It's a biological issue. So, no matter how many times you've been told that you're lazy or dumb or whatever caused by the, the excess weight situation, um, we're gonna say that that's not really the case. And all we're gonna ask is, that you commit to working with us to take the surgery in hand and to work with it to gain better weight and better health over time. Okay, now having said all this about how diet uh, and exercise and all those things can't work alone, 
We don't want people to just think about surgery and jump into it the next day. This is a very big deal as we're gonna talk about and, and a person needs to be convinced in their heart that they've come to the place where they need this major last resort intervention. Why is this? Two parts. First of all, to succeed with surgery, it is going to be necessary to diet and to exercise with the surgical operation. The second thing is that people commonly have this thing called buyer's remorse. And that's the situation, you all know it, where you wake up two days or two months later and you say, oh my God, why did I do that? Okay, and if you had surgery and you say, oh my gosh, why did I do that? Well, you need to already have the sense of conviction in your heart that you've really done everything else that you can do other than the surgery, okay? And that's what's gonna give you the conviction and the drive to work with the surgery for the lifestyle change to lose weight and become healthier. Now we're gonna talk about the surgical treatment for obesity. Um, we're gonna talk about the three main surgical options that are available in our practice at this time. And I'm gonna start with the gastric bypass operation. The gastric bypass is done by uh, using a surgical stapler to cut across the stomach and create a tiny little stomach pouch. It is so small, it's hard to believe. It's about the size of an egg yolk, or if you're gonna take our test later on, it's about the size of the surgeon's thumb. And this is really amazingly small, but this turns out to be what's necessary to help people lose weight in the long run. So this, this small pouch just does not hold much food. Now, surgically, what's also done is we bring a section of the small intestine from lower down and we hook it onto the stomach pouch so that food goes out into this intestine and this intestine is not built to handle sugar. So that if people eat sugar after a gastric bypass operation, they're going to have something called dumping syndrome, which I'll talk about more in just a little bit. Now the gastric bypass in our practice is almost always done laparoscopically. Um, actually weight is not an impediment to us being able to do the surgery with multiple small incisions because we're gonna get you to lose weight before surgery. Um, and there are only some situations like major previous surgery that would stop us from being able to do this gastric bypass laparoscopically. One thing that people, people often want to know with the gastric bypass operation is what happens with the lower stomach. Um, diagrams that we use that you've just looked at um, will make it look like the stomach might twist around or die off or something like that. But surgically, I want to assure you that we leave the blood supply to that stomach in place, undisturbed, so that the um, stomach remains in the right place. It's held, by their, held there by the blood vessels, and it also remains healthy as it uh, receives its normal blood supply over time. And the other key thing that's a common question with the gastric bypass, you know, once we've bypassed that lower part of the stomach, and the first part of the intestine, which is called the duodenum. Um, once we bypass those things, can you absorb food and can you absorb medicines and can you absorb vitamins? And the answer to that is 95% yes. Um, absorption of foods and medicines is almost completely normal. There are a couple of things such as iron and magnesium and calcium and B12 that are not completely normally absorbed. To compensate, we're gonna give you some supplements that will uh, take care of those situations and monitor your blood work over time after the operation. One key feature of the gastric bypass is that it causes dumping syndrome. Um, the jejunum, which is where the food goes after it leaves the stomach, does not handle sugar well. So that if a person has sugar after surgery, like a milkshake or M&Ms or something like that, they're gonna feel physically ill. And that's called dumping syndrome. And the way that feels is usually it involves cramping, pain, nausea, diarrhea, throwing up. Usually after half an hour, people feel very weak and they feel like they wanna die, and he won't. And it's actually not dangerous, even though it feels terrible. But this is a key thing about the gastric bypass that it strongly steers people away from sugars, okay? And now people also worry, well, is that gonna to happen to me every day or every week? And the practical experience of gastric bypass patients is that it almost never happens because the cool thing is that you lose your taste for sugar. So people pretty much just stay away from those things as they go along in life. Okay, now changing gears to talk about the lap band operation. The lap band is a different procedure from the gastric bypass where a plastic or elastic belt is placed around the upper part of the stomach to create, once again, this very tiny stomach pouch. Same size as the gastric bypass, which is how big? It's the size of your thumb, okay? Tiny stomach pouch and the band constricts the stomach in a gentle calibrated way so that the um, food enters that stomach pouch and fills it easily. 
and then the band, which is a restricted outlet, lets that food out just slowly. It trickles out over the next couple hours after the meal so that what we aim for is to use the balloon on the inside of the band to squeeze just right so that it's easy for a person to become full. In the opposite of hunger, it's called satiety. So it's easy for a person to gain satiety and then to keep that nice sense of satiety or fullness for several hours after you eat. So the band doesn't necessarily physically stop you from eating, but it makes it so that you don't feel like you have to eat. You don't have the hunger pushing on you and driving you to eat as you go through the day. And so you can pass up the animal crackers on your coworker's desk or you can choose not to eat the cupcake at your daughter's birthday party or something along those lines. Okay, we like to talk about conceptualizing this really tiny stomach and I've mentioned, I want you to look at the diagram about how small this thing really is. You know, we've got a picture here of uh, one of our partner's thumbs. This is actually Dr. Stegeman's thumb in this diagram and so that you can see that the stomach really is this tiny, tiny size that we're aiming to create at the time of surgery. On the lap band, the other thing that uh, patients need to know about is the port. Now, uh, the way that we adjust a band is that the inside of the band has a balloon, and that balloon is connected to tubing, which is connected to a port that sits on the muscle underneath the skin. Now, I want to emphasize that this port is not sticking out so that people can see it, okay? You can feel it if you go looking for it. It'll feel like a small lump under the skin, but it's planted on the muscle, and uh, the way that adjustments are done is that in our clinic, on a periodic basis after the surgery, we put a skinny needle into that port and we inject saline fluid. That's a water-based salt solution that's completely safe. And that fluid goes into the balloon so that when the balloon is filled, it actually squeezes a little bit on your stomach. And that's the adjustment process after a lap band operation. Now, I mentioned way back in the talk that there are just a few medical situations where a person um, should choose one or the other operation. And there are a few situations where a lap band ought not be done. And those situations are that if a person has had major surgery on their stomach in the past, that's probably a problem with the band. Now I want to emphasize that having your gallbladder out or maybe a hysterectomy or a C-section that's not surgery on the stomach itself. That's surgery in what we call the abdomen, or you might say the belly. Um, what I'm talking about is if you had previous weight loss surgery, then the band might not be a good idea, or ulcer surgery or something like that. Okay, so that's one thing. The other major situation where a person probably should not have a band is if they've got really, really severe heartburn and reflux. Okay, and especially if they've got a situation where their esophagus, which is the swallowing tube, if that does not function well, and if they tend to have a situation where food sticks or hangs up on them, then that's probably not a good situation for the band. And the issue here is that the band needs to work with the esophagus, and the esophagus needs to pump the food down in a normal way to make the food sit in the stomach pouch, and that's how the band gives a person satiety. So if a person has awful reflux, and if the esophagus is not working well, then they can continue to have heartburn after the surgery, and maybe they don't get a good sense of fullness like they should. So if that's your particular situation with really severe reflux or this difficulty swallowing or hanging up situation, then we're probably going to recommend the gastric bypass, which works quite well in that type of situation. The other situation where a lap band probably should not be done is a situation where a person lives very far away from San Antonio. Um, the gastric bypass and the gastric sleeve, uh, we're very comfortable doing those operations for people that live far away because we can check labs and do email follow-up and things like that. And people need to come maybe once every six months or every year once they heal. Um, with the lap band, the adjustment process requires very intensive follow-up after the surgery is done. And within the first two or three months, patients are going to need to be here in our clinic four, maybe six, maybe even eight times during that time frame. And our experience has been that when people live more than two hours drive away from San Antonio, they just don't make it in for that follow-up or not as frequently as they should. And this is a problem because without being adjusted properly, the band is not going to work very well for you to create the sense of satiety and the nice weight loss that we aim for. So we really need to think about distance when we're talking about which surgical procedure. Now, one very big source of discussion is which surgical procedure should you choose? And it may sound strange to you, but we as surgeons, in most cases, are not going to tell you which operation you should have done. 
we're going to want to educate you about all the operations, all the surgical procedures, and then have you choose which one you do. And at the moment, I'm going to compare the gastric bypass and the lap band because these are the two well-established procedures and because these are the ones that are more likely to be covered by insurance. And I'm going to cover the gastric sleeve, which is a newer option, in just a minute. Okay, so the gastric bypass and the lap band. First of all, the gastric bypass is the operation that's been around for a long time and it's what a lot of people call the gold standard of surgery. That means that we know what it does, we know how it does it, we know that it's successful. Those are good things, but the gastric bypass is a big deal operation. It involves cutting across the stomach, it involves moving intestine around, it involves reattaching one thing to another, and so it does have a decent chance of complications even when the surgeon and the patient do the right thing. Okay, The band is a somewhat newer operation. Now, new is relative because the band's now been around for almost 10 years. It's been in use in Australia and in Europe since the mid-90s. It's been in use in the U.S. since 2001. It's been in use in our practice since 2002. And so it's a pretty well-established technique. And by the way, we like both of these things, okay? For most of you who are thinking about this, we are going to support your decision, whichever one you choose, with just a couple of exceptions, which I've already mentioned. Okay, so the band is relatively new, which is to say that we don't have 15 and 20 year outcomes with the band but we've got five and 10 year outcomes and they look very good. They're different, weight loss is slower than with the gastric bypass, okay? Um, the band on the day of surgery is a smaller operation than the gastric bypass and that can be appealing. And it might seem off the face of it that the band is the only thing to do because it's a lower risk operation. And well, I would support the idea that a band is a lower risk thing and a lower impact thing on the day of surgery I want people to remember that they're carrying this plastic belt around their stomach for many years, really hopefully for the rest of their life. Um, and um, so that has its little bit of risk day in and day out. And in my experience as a surgeon who likes both operations and does both operations, I would say that the risk between the band and the gastric bypass is pretty much a wash once you look at the five and 10 year length of time span. Now, um, people get very concerned about the bypass part of the gastric bypass and deficiencies of absorption of iron and other minerals um, and that's partially true but I need to let people know that deficiencies can also occur with the band uh, because of just lower intake and so what we're going to do here is we're going to recommend exactly the same supplements and vitamins and iron and lab tests for both of our sets of patients and actually the sleeve as well um, so that we watch all these things and our experience is that none of these is a major problem with any of the operations in terms of nutrient deficiencies. <clears throat> so when we compare dumping syndrome, which the gastric bypass has and the band does not, um, that's a major difference between these operations and some people really like the idea of dumping. It helps steer them away from foods that they know are problems for them. Other people say, shoot, I never want to have dumping syndrome, it sounds terrible. And really honestly, either one of those has a very valid opinion, so I'm going to respect your choice in that regard. We need to also talk about the difference in the rate of weight loss. The gastric bypass is going to cause pretty rapid weight loss, especially over the first three and four months, continuing over the next year or so, so that the weight settles out 12, 15, 18 months after the operation. The band is going to cause some initial rapid weight loss, we hope, um, and then slower and steadier weight loss that goes on up to maybe three years after the surgery. And these operations are going to end up pretty much in the same ballpark on average. Um, so that in both cases, people are going to end up at a lower, healthier weight. Um, again, not all the way down to the ideal body weight in either case, but definitely lower and definitely healthier and pretty similar. I will say that the gastric bypass seems to create more reliable weight loss. What do I mean by that? Um, talk about the band. I've got a, a great set of band patients who have been 100% successful with their band. And then I've got another set of band patients who have lost 30 or 40 pounds and they're pretty happy and they're healthier, but that's not what I would consider tremendously successful weight loss. That's maybe 20% of my band population. And that 30 or 40, maybe 50 pound weight loss just about never happens with a gastric bypass. The least a person might lose after a gastric bypass is 70 or 80 pounds. And so that's what I mean by variability. Um, where is that coming from? I'm not sure if it's all biology or if it's how much the patient works with the surgery or if it's follow up but those are the statistics and that seems to be getting supported by national data as well. 
The last key difference between the gastric bypass and the lap band has to do with the band adjustment process. And this is the thing, the gastric bypass doesn't have any adjustment that can be done or needs to be done, and the band does. Now, for some people, this is a really cool feature. Um, some patients want to be very active participants in their weight loss process, and how tight is the band, and you know, how am I eating with it, and they don't mind frequent clinic follow-ups, which goes with the band, um, and, and that's great. Other people know that they live a distance or they have a hard time making it into clinic because of work considerations, other things along those lines, and those people are gonna be more in the direction of a gastric bypass. And just like the other issues, I can support people either way, but those are differences between the procedures. Okay, I'm gonna change gears now and talk about a newer surgical procedure uh, called the gastric sleeve or a sleeve gastrectomy. And for reasons you'll see as you look at the diagram, sometimes people also call it the banana stomach operation. This is an operation that's also done laparoscopically that involves using a surgical stapler to cut along the length of the stomach and create kind of a narrow tube stomach, which is dramatically smaller than the full size stomach and which really seems to have a very nice promotion of satiety. Remember, that's the absence of hunger. And in this particular operation, that stomach that's cut off or separated, this stomach is removed. So that's a difference from the gastric bypass where the bypass stomach stays in and continues living and continues making digestive juices. In the sleeve operation, that's physically taken out, which you don't need it, so that's okay, but people just need to understand that difference. What happens with the sleeve is that patients experience very nice suppression of hunger so that they don't feel an urge to eat. They lose weight pretty rapidly in a way that's similar to the gastric bypass. There's not any abnormality of absorption like there is with the gastric bypass. There's not any dumping like there is with the gastric bypass. There's not any adjustment process or clinic follow-up like the band. And these are some of the features that are differences from the gastric bypass or the band that attract people to the gastric sleeve. There are two major cautionary notes on this sleeve operation. Number one is that we don't know yet what the five and 10 year weight loss results are with the sleeve. Okay, we've got three year results, actually nationally, three year results exist that are very favorable and look a whole lot like the gastric bypass. Okay, but honestly, in medicine and surgery, we've learned over and over again that you don't know the full story until five or 10 years have passed. So that's a caution. And I'm not scared about it, but I want people to know as they consider this operation. The second concern is just a, an administrative and a practical one. This operation is fairly new. It's just being widely discussed within the last year or so. And it's only in the last year that we've begun to do it in our practice. Um, and insurance companies are not buying into the ban no, I'm sorry, are not buying into the sleeve yet. And that's just what they do with every new procedure. They'll call it experimental or investigational. And quite frankly, at this time, that's true with the sleeve, okay? It's very favorable investigational, but it's not fully established. So if the sleeve is really appealing to you, the insurance process is gonna be one extra thing that we'll have to get past or an extra hurdle that we may have to cover. Now, I mentioned that this sleeve operation is relatively new to our practice. I do wanna reassure people that this is a technically very straightforward operation that we feel very comfortable and very easy doing coming from the background of doing a laparoscopic gastric bypass or a lap band operation. So that part of it is not a problem. Now, as you go through this education process leading into the surgery, you are going to meet with the dietitian and learn in great detail what the do's and don'ts are with the diet at, with the surgery. I'm gonna cover it briefly right now because I think it's very important to emphasize from the beginning that people have to work with the surgery, use the surgical procedure as a tool to get the most out of it for weight loss and health, okay? So the things to do are to eat only small amounts of food and quit when your hunger's gone, okay? To eat up to three meals a day, and in other words, don't nibble like a bird all day long because it is possible to eat around your operation, okay? Avoid carbohydrates and sweets, okay? and don't eat too fast. This is a curious thing. We want your meal to take between 20 and 30 minutes. And I'll explain why that is in just a moment. Also in the category of things that you should do is that you should focus on proteins and vegetables because with a very limited amount of food that you're taking in, you wanna make sure that you're getting nutritious food and avoiding filling up your stomach with junk, which is even more important when you've got a tiny little stomach, okay? The things to not do 
are the opposite of the do's, and that is don't nibble constantly, don't eat real fast, and like I said, I'll come back to that. Um, stay away from sweets, and also stay away from starches, okay? Breads, pasta, rice, and potatoes are all starches that are going to work against your best weight loss. That's a problem, okay? And then the other kind of weird rule is don't drink with your food, okay? Why is that? The best thing that the surgery can do for you, all of these operations, is for the food to be retained in a healthy way in your little stomach pouch. Because as long as that food, like chicken, is in your stomach, it's going to send signals to your brain that say, hey, I'm not really hungry, I don't have to have some food right now. Okay? But if you drink with your food, then what's going to happen is that that water or whatever is going to wash the food on through. And so then, as soon as your stomach pouch is emptied out, the clock is ticking and pretty soon you're going to be hungry again. So that's why we educate people on not eating and drinking together. It's okay to drink up until your meal begins, and then not drink with your meal, and then not drink for an hour after your meal so that you have some sustained satiety. And that might seem weird because in America we're so used to doing this thing, we go fork and glass and fork and glass, just right. But do we have to do that? If you try this out, if you don't drink with your meal, a couple good things are going to happen. First thing is that you're actually going to chew thoroughly, you're probably going to taste the food better, you're going to eat and swallow more slowly because you have to let your saliva kind of mix in with this, and I'm not trying to be gross, but this is how it actually works, and then swallow the food. And because it takes longer now, and because you're not washing it out, then you're going to become full quicker. And this actually also works with a normal stomach. So when you're trying to lose weight before surgery and you're practicing your surgical diet, one of the good things to do is to actually uh, go ahead and practice this not eating and drinking thing. And it's a difficult habit. I've tried it, and I know it is. But it's one of the key things about losing weight the best after the surgery. Okay, so now why do we want you to take between 20 and 30 minutes to eat? One key thing for patients to know is that the nerves of satiety connect the stomach and the brain, but they're slow nerves. Okay, so what happens is, unlike your fingertip, right, when you touch your finger, you know basically instantly. Um, unlike your fingertip, when your stomach fills up, the signal that goes to your brain to tell you that you're full takes about five minutes. And if your stomach pouch is this big, that's a forkful or a chicken nugget, all right? <laughs> you can eat three or six or 10 chicken nuggets in two minutes, right? I mean, not that people actually do that, but people are used to inhaling food or eating in the car. Well, I mean, what if you fill up on the first chicken nugget and the next two minutes you eat the next one, and now by the time the signal gets to your brain, you're over full and you're hurting, and you have nausea and pain, and, by the way, you just ate a chicken nugget and the calories that you didn't have to have. So we're gonna want you to practice taking at least 20 minutes and no more than 30 minutes to eat your meal. Okay, and on the longer end of it, why not take 45 minutes or an hour to eat? And I'll explain that one just by telling you the story of my dear patient, sweet 55-year-old lady, who came to me about a month after a gastric bypass and said, listen, Dr. P, it took me an hour and a half to eat that Luann platter, but I did it. Okay, that doesn't make sense, right? That's not what you want to do. So you don't want to stretch out your meal to eat and eat and eat and eat. When you've reached 30 minutes, you're done. If you haven't eaten by that time, you don't need it. Okay, so that's basically the do's and don'ts on the diet. Very important stuff. We're going to be very big about physical activity for you before surgery and especially after surgery. We're gonna want you to start walking, actually, on the day of the operation, okay? And our commitment is that we'll work on pain control, and we'll work on having folks who are there to escort you. We actually affectionately call them the walk Nazis, okay? So we're gonna help you get up and walk because we think that walking is gonna help your breathing, it's gonna help your intestinal recovery, and it's gonna, most importantly, reduce the chance of your forming blood clots in your legs that might break off and go to your lungs, okay? And that's one of the scariest things that can happen after any operation. Walking is key. And we're gonna want you to move pretty quickly from walking into regular exercise. And what I mean is that at your first follow-up appointment, about two weeks after surgery, the odds are very high that the surgeon is going to clear you to normal, unrestricted activity. Now, you might still be sore a little bit at that time, but we're gonna say that it is okay for you to lift and twist and run and bend and everything. 
at about two weeks after surgery. And we want you to push that a little bit and go on and get into it and trust that the little incisions cannot be damaged by what you might do physically. I shoot, you can go kickboxing for all I care. I want you to do more stuff, try it out. Now, I've mentioned a couple things already about diet and exercise, but I wanna put it in really simple terms. Patients who undergo these operations commit to working with the surgical procedure to get the most out of it. What does that mean? That means you got a diet. It means choosing the right foods. That's the diet. It doesn't mean being hungry all the time. It means you've got to have increased physical activity. Now, does that mean you have to run a marathon and, and work the treadmill until you feel like you're going to die? No, but increased activity after the surgery does mean that you've got to get an increased heart rate for 20 or 30 minutes most of the days of the week, four or five, hopefully six or seven times a week. And that takes time. And here in America, especially if you're the mom watching the kids and carting them from school and back and forth and doing activities, and especially if you have your own job, that can be a really big hurdle. Okay? And the time organization, I can't solve for you. But I'm just going to stand here and tell you that that's going to be a big factor in your success or not after the surgery. Okay? The surgery will work some without exercise, but it clearly, over and over again, we've demonstrated, clearly works better with regular, sustained physical activity, okay? Other commitments. Patients need to take, on, take extra vitamins and calcium. They need to take extra iron, and they need to follow up with the team and get labs done for life, okay? This obesity thing is a lifetime disease. Surgery is a particular event, but we're getting you into a whole different process that you need to stick with this whole thing and not just what happens that one day on the day of the surgery. Okay, so those are kind of the patient commitments that you need to be really geared up, and that gets back to that sense of conviction I was talking about earlier about why surgery is a last resort. Doing this follow-up does mean that there's going to be time commitment for you also, sitting in the clinic, um, and co-pays. I mean, you know, coming to the clinic is going to cost you know, 25 bucks or 30 bucks or whatever your copay is, um, and that's what's necessary to staff the clinic and keep the lights on. I promise that nobody's trying to get rich off of you from this surgery and certainly not from the follow-up part of things. So, um, but by the same token, I think it's fair for you to be prepared on that or be aware of it and, and know that those medical charges are gonna go along as we do the follow-up. Now, in exchange, you'll have a lot fewer medicines and a lot fewer co-pays and you'll need to see your regular doctor much less frequently. So you are gonna come out ahead, even from a money standpoint. In fact, um, a calculation's been done that if you use your cookie jar, which doesn't have cookies anymore, and save all the money that you're not spending on just groceries and restaurants, just save the food money. That adds up to about five grand in the first year after surgery. Pretty cool. Now, depending on your medical situation, um, you may save five grand or 10 grand or $15,000 uh, in medicines and co-pays. Now, I'm adding in what the insurance pays and all that stuff, but um, really big numbers in a very short period of time, okay? Now, what's the expected weight loss after surgery? Most people can expect to lose down to something that's within sight of their ideal body weight. What do I mean by that? First of all, we're not going to try to get you down to your actual ideal body weight. That would be too low for the vast majority of you who are thinking about this surgery. You'd be unhealthy at that level. You'd be too skinny, weak, tired, and you wouldn't look good either. So the best weight loss which not everybody's going to achieve, but the best weight loss is to end up at 20 or 30 pounds over the ideal weight. Your body having the weight that it has today, 100, 200 pounds overweight, has some structure that it's not able to lose in a healthy way so that it would actually be unhealthy for you to lose all of it. Now, is everybody going to lose down to that great level of 20 or 30 pounds over ideal? Actually, no. Uh, people, most people are going to end up still carrying 20 or 30 percent of their excess weight, and depending on where you start, that might mean that you still got an extra 50 pounds or 60 pounds or 70 pounds, or I'll put it a different way. Pretty much everybody is going to end up under 225 pounds. A lot of people are going to end up under 200. Some rare people are going to end up at 150 or maybe on the low side of 150, and that's pretty uncommon. You've got to start at 220 or something to get under 150. For some of our patients who are starting at 500 pounds or 600 pounds before surgery, those folks were really hoping to get you down into the 200s, but it's not realistic to talk about getting you under 200 pounds, okay? And, and these are all generalizations. When you sit down one-on-one -on -one with your selected surgeon, 
um, that surgeon is going to be able to give you a better estimate of uh, what your actual weight loss is likely to be. And that also is going to relate to the timing and what surgical procedure you have, your age, your medical conditions, and things along those lines. One key point is that 85% of patients after the gastric bypass are going to be what we call fully successful. That means that five years later, you've still got most of your excess weight gone, and that's also a marker for life. Okay? Everybody knows somebody that's gained all their weight back after they had stomach stapling or something that somebody calls. You know, my Aunt Minnie had stomach stapling and she lost a lot, but then she gained all back. Everybody's heard that story. Well, this data is that some people do gain the weight back, some of it, usually not all, but 85% of people are looking at this flat, lower weight loss compared to this starting place, okay? So that's not talking about any special super duper patients, that's just averages of thousands and thousands of patients, 85% fully successful. And that's in our practice and also national statistics. All right, now when you lose weight, do the medical conditions improve? And the cool thing is absolutely yes. Okay, I talked about sleep apnea earlier. Sleep apnea is 40% cured, gone, 100%. And all the people that are not cured are much better. And so they sleep better and have better energy and better memory. The other key medical condition I want to touch on is diabetes. A gastric bypass cures diabetes in about 85% of patients. Cures it. Now, the endocrine doctors and I have a friendly ongoing argument about, well, is it cured or is it in remission? And I just like to say that if the patient has a normal blood sugar and they don't take any medicines ever again in their life, that's pretty close to cured. So that's what I call it. And they can say remission <laughs> however much they want, okay? Other medical conditions, high blood pressure, heartburn and reflux, joint pain also substantially improve with this surgery, okay? Now there are a few other situations or conditions that we can frequently see improvement. And I'm just gonna let you look at the list on our slide there. You'll be able to pick out your own thing to recognize. And we also, we wanna be realistic with people when we're talking about this surgery. So we're gonna talk about a couple medical conditions that we would not expect to improve with weight loss, okay? One key thing is depression. Depression pretty much is a biochemical imbalance in your brain that needs medication and probably will still need medication after the surgery, even if you have wonderful weight loss. Another thing is if you have surgical back pain, that means if you have a slipped disc or something like that and you need surgery, well, you're probably still gonna need surgery for that slipped disc. Now, it'll be a lot easier to get through that surgery and a lot easier to recover from it, but um, you know, that still is gonna be a necessity. If you have blood vessel blockage, that's probably not gonna get better. Although if you've got blood flow problems, there's a good chance that that will get better. One last thing about something that you can't necessarily expect to improve is interpersonal conflict. What do I mean? If you chronically fight with fill in the blank, spouse, coworker, children, person on the street, whatever, if you're chronically in conflict with people, that's probably still gonna continue. It may seem like it's about the weight and maybe today it is about the weight, but I just, the experience has been that uh, weight loss is just gonna change the subject of that. So just you know, be prepared for that and don't expect weight loss to cure every single thing. Key, key point here, all of these surgical procedures that we're talking about are permanent, okay? The surgical procedures are gonna create changes in your body that are difficult to reverse. Now the band is a little bit of an exception. It is the case that the band can be removed and leave behind a basically normal stomach. Would we plan to remove it? The answer is no, okay? Because the experience is that um, people need the support of the surgical procedure to keep their weight under control and keep their intake under control for life, okay? In other words, if the surgery is reversed or if the band is removed, basically 100% of people regain the weight and regain all the weight. Okay, and people also think about this band, this piece of plastic, and they ask, well, okay, I'm 22 years old, I wanna live until I'm 80, what's that thing gonna look like 65 years from now? Well, this band material is, uh, is permanent, basically, and it's designed to be in your body forever, and so I like telling people that 200 years from now, when you're dust, that band's still gonna be sitting there looking pretty much exactly like it did the day that I put it in. So really seriously, from multiple different angles, the surgical procedure is a permanent thing and you need to think about it in that way as you decide if this is something for you. True or false, surgery cures the underlying cause of obesity, that's false. 
Surgery is a block to eating. It doesn't cure whatever it is biologically that made you get fat in the first place. We're gonna talk for a little while about the risks of the surgery. And one key thing that people need to know about with risk is that there is a chance of dying with one of these operations. There's a chance of dying with any operation that you might have done, okay? I want you to trust that with this risk and all the risks that I'm gonna talk about, that your surgeon is only going to take you into surgery once they've carefully considered your situation, they've, lo they've looked at your risk of surgery, risk of death and risk of everything else that might happen, and your risk of the weight, and they're only gonna recommend surgery for you if there's a really significant mismatch where the surgery is less risky than the weight, okay? And for the majority of people who are thinking about this surgery, that's definitely a true statement. The weight is a lot more risky than the surgery itself. And that's a key point for people who will question you also about this. People will say to you, ah, oh, you're not heavy enough to need the surgery, or you're just taking the easy way out, or something like that. And, and a question back to them that's very reasonable is, well, what do you propose that I do? And do you think that I'm just okay sitting here with an extra 150 pounds today? Because you're not, okay? Your body suffers ongoing damage every day. All right, now back to this death thing. We need to put some numbers on it. The risk of dying from a bariatric surgical procedure is extremely variable. It goes from about 0.1% in the lowest risk patients up to 10 or 15% in uh, very high risk patients. And I wanna reassure you that if you're a high risk patient or if you know a high risk patient, you know who you are. These are people who are gonna die within the next six months or so without weight loss. And they scare you to be in the room with them. They're people that have a hard time breathing just sitting there. Okay, so the vast majority of people that we operate on are in the lower risk category. And the surgeon's gonna talk to you about your particular risk when you and the surgeon meet and talk about your particular medical situation. So I don't want you to get too tied up with the numbers right now, but one more number I'm gonna give you is that the national average chance of dying from bariatric surgery is 0.2%. In other words, about one out of 500, okay? And it's a tragedy every time somebody dies, but in comparison to the number of people that would have died in that same time period without surgery, guess what? Statistically, surgery comes out way ahead. Now, that 0.2%, that's all different types of patients, all different types of surgery, all different surgeons, all different locations. It doesn't include center, or it doesn't focus on center of excellence. Okay, and the risk of dying in our practice, all comers, is about 0.13%. It's, it's a little higher than the 0.1 when we include all of our patients. Patients wanna know sometimes, have I had a patient die? And I have, okay? I've been doing this since 95, and I've had three patients die, and two of those were identified before surgery as very high risk patients. It doesn't make it okay, but that's just kind of how that goes. And, and I'm also not trying to scare anybody, but I want it to be a real thing and not just a theoretical discussion that people can die as a result of this operation. Now, the risk discussion is a lot more complicated than that. We need to talk about all the other things that can happen. So first we talk about, well, how do risks happen? The gastric bypass is a big deal operation. If we say that um, a heart operation is a 10 on a scale of one to 10, give you just kind of a handle because people have an idea about heart surgery. A gastric bypass is probably a five or seven magnitude on that scale of one to 10. A band is probably a three or a four, but we still need to think of it as a pretty significant operation because of the long-term changes it creates on your stomach. Um, and the sleeve probably falls in between those operations at about a four or five magnitude. Um, the sleeve does involve stapling across the stomach. It involves removing a section of the stomach, but it does not involve moving any body parts around internally. Okay, so that's kind of the magnitude of the procedures. Um, and before we talk about risks that go particularly with a surgical procedure, we're gonna talk about just risks of doing the surgery. And here's one people don't usually think about. What if we try to do the surgery and we just can't do it? That happens every once in a while. It's actually not very common caused by weight, although that does happen from time to time. A more common thing, still rare, is that uh, patients can have an unexpected finding when we go into surgery. I've had two patients in my experience where we found cancer that we didn't know about before the surgery, okay? And in one of those cases, we were able to take care of it and go on to a cure. In another case, we were not. Um, you know, in neither of those cases was there a test that we could have known about it beforehand, but we couldn't do the gastric bypass or the band on that day. It wasn't proper, okay? 
the whole spectrum of tissues where we're operating is at risk for us injuring them, okay? And so that includes for any of the operations, the liver, the spleen, the esophagus, the pancreas, the gallbladder, all the blood vessels and all the nerves in that area, the diaphragm, and things on the wall of the body and also all the other intestines because we're going to go into your belly with things that cut and things that cauterize and things that staple and things that suture and if those aren't handled exactly correctly then they can cause injuries and believe me um, we're going to do our best to handle them correctly but also even in experienced hands paying attention with good help we can have problems and create injuries to the nearby organs and that's where the two surgeons come in and that's where we're going to pay attention to that kind of thing and fix it while we're there but we want to let you know that injuries to some of these tissues can happen also just generally speaking with any surgery people can have bleeding or they can have an infection i'm happy to say that both of those especially infection are very very rare people also focus it tends to be the case on what's going on inside the belly where the surgery is happening but we need to recognize that there's also increased stress on the body caused by the trauma of the surgery. And the big thing that can happen, in fact, the number one killer after all these operations is a blood clot in the lungs. The medical name for that is pulmonary embolus, or PE for short, which you don't have to remember. But the way that comes up is that when a person is asleep under anesthesia, a blood clot can form in the legs that can break off and go to the lungs and this blood clot can potentially block off enough blood flow to cause the heart to fail and you can die from that. And in our practice and across the country, pulmonary embolus is actually the number one killer after any weight loss operation. Now, this is also an area where our practice has one-fifth the national standard of the chance of this happening. It's not zero, okay, but it's very low in comparison to other places and we think that's from walking which is the best defense against blood clots and blood thinners that we use and leg compression stockings that keep the blood flowing in the legs during the surgery. Okay, so what else can happen in the rest of the body as a result of the stress of the surgery? Basically, we're just gonna put extra stress on your heart and your lungs and your kidneys and your liver, all the vital organs caused by the surgery and, and they need to be prepared to handle that. And if something else happens like an infection that puts extra stress, people can have renal failure, kidney failure, for example, and then your risk starts to go up and up and up along those lines. So it's not all what happens right in here, and this is why we're gonna to wanna to talk to you about getting completely prepared from an overall medical standpoint. Now, what kinds of things can happen, particularly in relation to the gastric bypass? The gastric bypass can leak, okay, which means that stuff that's supposed to be inside the stomach leaks to the outside, which can create an infection. Um, and fortunately that's very rare. The last time that happened in one of my patients was back in October of 2002, but it's a big deal if it happens, and it means that you might need a reoperation and you're sick for a while. Um, gastric bypass can have bleeding because we staple across all that intestine, which has wonderful rich blood supply. Of course, we aim to seal off those blood vessels, and the surgery is not done until we look around and see that there's not any bleeding, but because we're giving you blood thinner, you can have bleeding after the surgery, okay? The idea is it's all a balance in this. Um, and then the other thing that can happen with the gastric bypass is that people can develop bowel obstruction or twisting and blockage of the intestine. And this comes from the fact that we're moving the intestine from one place to another. The intestine can get itself twisted in a funny spot after the surgical procedure is done. And that's most likely within the first couple months after the surgery but actually it can happen going on up to three months or six months or three years or 10 years after the surgery. It's a teeny chance, but it can happen. And this is another key part about staying in touch with your surgeon and your home program, okay? Now the band has its own set of risks as well. I'm gonna talk about two, actually three key issues with the band, okay? One key thing is something called band erosion. Now what happens with band erosion is that the band actually can sitting on the stomach, can wear its way through the wall of the stomach. And everybody's seen uh, barbed wire on a living tree, right, where the tree kind of grows around the barbed wire over time. Well, the stomach can do the same kind of thing with the band so that in a few cases you can end up with a band that's kind of half in and half out of the stomach. And that's actually not an emergency, believe it or not, because it happens very gradually, but if it's left alone it can cause serious infection, 
So if an erosion occurs, that band must be removed, and it's not proper to put a band back in at some point down the road. So we would offer to the patient after healing that we would go back and do some other surgical procedure. So erosion is a really bad problem, but I'm happy to say it's quite rare. And in our, actually has not happened in our practice yet, but the national statistics are that an erosion happens in two or three out of 1,000 patients, okay? And we don't think that's caused by anything the patient did or the surgeon did wrong. It seems to be just something with that patient and the band material. All right, the next thing with the band is band slip. Now, um, when you look at the diagram, it would have you believe that the band is actually gonna slide up on the esophagus, and that's not what happens. There's some tissues not in that diagram that block the band and prevent it from sliding back up in that direction. What actually happens is you've got the band, your tiny little stomach pouch, and that stomach pouch naturally will expand just a little bit with a meal. And that's okay if it's a little bit, but if that stomach pouch pulls some of the other stomach up through the band, so the stomach slips, the pouch enlarges, and this enlarged pouch now pushes the band down onto that middle of the stomach. So you've got the band, which is a fixed size ring, now sitting down around the large middle part of the stomach, it's all stuffed in there, and there's no space or channel left in the middle so that the patient basically is blocked, okay? And they feel like things aren't going down. It causes pain and heartburn and nausea and throwing up. And people always wanna know, how do I know if it slips? Believe me, it'll be pretty obvious to you. You'll call us and then we'll have to fix it. Now, fixing a band slip usually means surgery. The good news on that is that the surgery almost always can be done laparoscopically, pretty much always can be done with the band still in place, and we get you back on track, readjust the band so that you're still losing weight and still with your original operation. Not that anybody ever wants to have a second operation, but a band slip is not as big a deal as a band erosion. The, um, the last thing to consider with the band in terms of risk is kind of a theoretical consideration, and that's the possibility of an allergic reaction to the band material. Now, um, I'm glad to say that the silicone elastomer, which is what the band's made out of, has been in use in medical devices in real people going back to the early 70s. And so this material has been tried and true and experimented with for a long time, and I actually am not convinced that there is such a thing as an allergic reaction to this material. Uh, but it's at least a theoretical consideration, and so it is something that people need to know about if they're thinking about a band as their choice. Um, and if you're somebody that was really concerned and really worked up about the um, silicone breast implant controversy back in the 80s, um, this is a related subject and the band probably is not for you. Okay. Um, thinking just a little bit more about risks after the surgery, there are just some other general things, side effects uh, that can happen. Um, every once in a while, a patient after we reorganize their intestines will have some kind of functional problem that we don't totally understand. And, and that's got to scare you when your surgeon says that they don't understand something. But, you know, I want you to know really what happens. Um, uh, and what happens in these situations is that patients, maybe two or three percent of our patients can have a month or two of nausea that we just have to work through. And some of these people need reoperations to straighten things out. Um, sometimes they need multiple additional tests. Uh, such as an upper scope or a CAT scan or something like that, um, I want to reassure folks that we do get those issues worked out so that people do end up doing well and, uh, and losing weight and getting better health down the road. Um, but again, I want to emphasize in parallel with that that this is a serious medical procedure and not just something that you do on your lunch break. This is done for the major problem of the weight and what that's doing to you as a therapy that we choose. Um, I'm happy to say that nutritional problems are very unlikely after any of these operations. If patients do continue to follow up with us and get labs checked and work with the dietitians and basically stick with the diet. Um, people who still have their gallbladders going into surgery may form gallstones because the gallbladder does not work very well when people are losing weight rapidly and that promotes gallstone formation. So some people will need their gallbladder out after operation. Um, for many of you, we'll check your gallbladder before surgery, and if you've got gallstones, uh, the surgeon will discuss with you. It may be proper to take that gallbladder out, um, and that's a little bit more of an individualized discussion according to which procedure you have, so I'm going to leave it at that for the moment. Okay, um, people commonly see hair loss as they're losing weight very rapidly. 
Um, this happens in about 50% of patients after any of the surgical procedures. It can happen with the band or the gastric bypass or the sleeve. And the hair loss can, unfortunately, be pretty dramatic. It's kind of like shedding. Um, and, and patients have their hairbrush fill up and their clothes are covered and it's all over the shower. And it can be a scary thing, but I'll reassure you that the hair does grow back to its normal consistency. Okay, so I've, I've had men ask me sometime who have hair like mine, they'll say, Doc, will I have a full head of hair after surgery? No, you'll just have hair that's like it was before we operated. Um, we also don't think that there's any particular protein supplement that you can take or any particular vitamin thing outside of our usual recommendations that are gonna change the chances on this. We keep our eyes open for new research on it, but right now it's pretty much just basic health care, and you might have some transient hair loss. Um, loose skin is a very, very common problem after the surgery. And in fact, the more successful you are, the more likely you are to have loose skin, right? Because the fat over years has stretched out your skin and caused it to kind of bulge out, and you're inflated like a balloon. As the fat melts, it's not going to melt away the skin. Also, the skin's going to tend to just fall down, unfortunately. Now, if you're on the right side of 40, which I'm not, and many of you are not, then you may have some elastic snap left in your skin, and that skin's going to shrink back in to a greater or lesser degree. But if you're a little bit on the older side, uh, you don't even have to be old, just kind of going towards that direction, then probably there's not that much elastic left, and you're going to have pretty significant skin flaps on the belly or the butt, maybe the breasts or the arms, okay? And so many people after they've stabilized their weight and nutritional status, find it's useful to go on to additional surgery to remove that excess skin. And we certainly are in favor of that once you're properly prepared and medically stable for it. And patients do generally find that to be a rewarding thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, plastic surgery is rarely covered by insurance right now. Um, they wanna, the insurance companies wanna call it cosmetic. Um, we surgeons definitely feel like it's a reconstructive plastic surgical procedure. Um, but that's an argument that's still going on, and we're just trying to get people covered for bariatric surgery right now. Um, those are pretty much the key side effects that may, people may run into that we don't exactly call risks. They're pretty common, but they can be addressed and worked on as we go along. So let's put this in summary. Okay? All these risks that I've talked about, all the potential problems, what actually happens? Um, I think it's fair to say that around 85% of our patients have a smooth course and things go according to plan. Things happen like they're supposed to. 10 to 12 percent or so have some kind of transient problem, maybe 13 percent, have some kind of transient problem that, um, that we get past. You know, maybe you've got to come to the ER once. Uh, maybe you actually need a reoperation, but you recover pretty well, and you get on track and things go along pretty well. So that's not what we want to happen, that 10 or 12 percent, but it's something that we can work through and get past. Um, and that leaves one or two or three percent of patients that have some kind of pretty serious sustained problem resulting from the surgery. I want to be really honest with you about this. It can happen that you can trade the weight and its problems for some kind of different gastrointestinal problem resulting from the surgery. Okay? Now, it's interesting. Um, most people that I've done surgery on, um, even the people that have these problems, tell me, and I, I don't quiz them about it, they just tell me, that they would do the same thing all over again, even if they had to have this problem, this, whether it's nausea or pain or something like that, they would do it all over again the same way because the weight is so bad. Okay, now I've, I've fortunately never suffered from that, so I can't make that judgment, but um, I think that's an important factor to consider, and, and even though we feel very concerned about the small percentage of patients with long-term problems, and we want people to know about it who are thinking about this, um, it does seem to balance favorably for the people that are actually living that situation. A couple of medicines that people need to absolutely avoid after surgery. Actually, a couple categories of medicines. The first thing is aspirin and all of the related medications. This group of medicines medically is called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or doctors say NSAIDs for short. You need to avoid these medicines because they can cause ulcers in the stomach pouch, especially with the gastric bypass, but we think it's a risk with the sleeve and the lap band also. So all of our patients that have had bariatric surgery, we want you to avoid aspirin and Motrin and Aleve and Telectin and Indomethacin and all those things. Now the tricky thing is that a lot of patients who are coming into the surgery 
have pretty bad arthritis or joint pain and you're taking these medicines right now, but I want to reassure you that as your weight comes down, that pain gets a lot better very quickly and we can make substitutions so that you can do very well without these medicines. Some of you are on aspirin for heart protection and I want to reassure you that we can make prescription substitutions so that you can have the heart protection without taking a medicine like aspirin that can cause ulcers for you. Okay, so the other category, one more thing on the pain medicine. So that whole category of over-the-counter pain medicines is a no-no. Pretty much the only thing that you can get over-the-counter for pain that is okay is Tylenol. Tylenol is okay. Everything else is a problem. All right. Now, the other group of medicines that people need to avoid after bariatric surgery are fluid pills, and they're medically called diuretics. Common ones are Lasix, which is also called furosemide, or hydrochlorothiazide. Now, these are commonly used as part of blood pressure medicine, so a lot of you guys are on these medicines, and it's okay to be on these leading up to surgery. But we're going to want you to not take them after surgery because one side effect of these medicines, the fluid pills, is that they make your body shed potassium. And because you're not eating very much, and because your body gets most of its potassium in food, that can cause a potentially dangerous low potassium level. So we'll want you to stop the fluid pills after surgery. The good news is that the rapid weight loss is going to cause your body to stop retaining as much fluid so that you won't need the fluid pills. That'll be one of the first ones they'll get, that we'll get rid of. Pregnancy after surgery. It is okay for a woman to become pregnant after they have a bariatric surgical procedure. In fact, a lot of our patients are coming to us because they want to have kids, but their hormones are all messed up and they can't conceive. So that's a really neat situation. Clearly, clearly, we want people to avoid becoming pregnant during the rapid weight loss, which is usually the first year after surgery. Please, please, please use reliable birth control for at least the first year after surgery, whatever surgery you have. Use reliable birth control, gotta say it. Now, after a year, after your weight has stabilized, your surgeon would love to work with your obstetrician on you becoming pregnant and hopefully carrying a baby that's healthy. And the cool thing is, after bariatric surgery, patients have the same pregnancy outcomes as the general non-obese population. That means the same average baby birth weight, the same nice low chance of birth defects, the same nice low chance of birth problems, and those are not zero, but you're no longer a high-risk pregnancy candidate. Isn't that cool? And um, in my population of patients, there have been about 65 healthy babies born in patients of mine um, who have had gastric bypass or lap band, okay? Don't have any sleeve moms yet, but that'll come over time as well. Okay, there are some psychological issues to consider as you lose massive amounts of weight. Um, People who are obese are not crazy, okay? But obesity and the, the life impact of it is a huge factor in how you live day in and day out. And so as you lose all this weight, you are going to undergo some major psychological stresses. That's a fact. And that's part of why we're gonna to wanna to get you checked out before surgery. It's not just to find out if you're ticking okay, but it's to set up the right support systems and the right psychological tools for you to use so that you can be the most successful as the weight comes down, okay? But also recognize, as I said earlier, if, you're, if your marriage is on the rocks or you're not succeeding at a job or whatever the situation is on a psychological interpersonal level, that's not gonna get fixed. Also, if you're using food as your stress relief or your comfort situation, and now we've surgically blocked your ability to do that, how are you gonna react to that? How are you gonna handle it? And that's something that you need to address with a therapist before you even get into surgery. I'm not saying that you can't have surgery from these issues, but it is something that you want to recognize and that you want to address before you go into the surgery. Now, the last thing is that it's pretty common in patients uh, coming in for the surgery for there to be some history of sexual abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder related to sexual abuse. And the situation seems to be that in some cases people use the weight as a barrier to keep that assaulting person away from them. And this may not be something that you even remember, but reflect on it. And if it's a situation for you, we'd like to avoid a crisis situation when you become slender and attractive to the opposite sex and they begin to approach you and you have flashbacks or some kind of crisis response to, oh my God, you know, this person's after me again. 
um, because we've seen that happen, and, and we'd like to try to get ahead of the power curve and prevent that from happening. Now, it turns out that you as the patient can really have a major significant impact on your risk and your outcome about the surgery. It's not all about what we do as the surgeons. Think about this for a second. If you were an Olympic athlete going to the Olympics, you would train for years leading up to that major event in your life, right? And I think I can make a pretty good case to say that your day of the surgery is going to be somewhere in the top five most important events of your life, okay? It has nothing to do with me or my partners. This is how it impacts you. So it only makes sense for you to approach this huge, seminal life event by preparing, or let's say training, in the best way possible. What does that mean? That means a couple things. Number one, exercise as best you can. Number two, lose some weight, which I'll come back to in a second. Number three, don't smoke. Now for those of you not smoking, that's an easy one. But for those of you who are smoking, I want to say why that's so important and why we're going to insist on it. Everybody knows that smoking interferes with the lungs, and that's true. People don't know that smoking also interferes with circulation, and it interferes with the body's normal clotting process, or it disrupts the normal clotting process, so that smokers have a much higher chance of lung complications, a 10 times higher chance of a leak from a gastric bypass, a 10 times higher chance of an infection with any of these operations, and a 10 times higher chance of one of these pulmonary embolus things. And those are such big changes in risk that as surgeons, as your physician, we're not going to set you up for surgery if you're still smoking. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to quit. Don't get me wrong. But I am saying that it is so important that it can't be avoided as a necessity to stop smoking before surgery. And guys, we will test you before the surgery, about a week before you're going to have blood work done and have some urine testing done and we're going to test for the presence of nicotine and it's a very sensitive test so that if you've been smoking or if you've even been around a lot, we'll know and we'll cancel the surgery. So I'm just telling you that now so we don't have to do that because it is so important and we're so serious about it. All right, now we're going to talk about the weight issue. <laughs> Many of you are sitting there listening to me and you're saying, well, Dr. Pilcher, are you just crazy? Because if I could lose weight whenever I wanted to, I wouldn't be here thinking about this surgery right now. As in other words, duh, why are you talking about me losing weight? Well, we talked earlier about how diet and exercise and medications do work. They're just temporary, right? And most of you have lost weight in the past. That's what we're talking about. I'm not talking about you losing 100 pounds. I'm talking about you losing enough to decompress your abdomen and decompress your liver in a way that's going to make the surgery easier to do and easier to recover from. Okay? And that amount of weight that you need to lose is going to be different for different people. A lot of my patients need to lose only 5 pounds. It's pretty common for me to ask for 10 or 15 pounds. 30 and 35 is the most. And that's talking about my patients who weigh 570 pounds when I meet them. Okay? So we're going to try to find an amount of weight loss that you can do that is going to have a positive impact on your surgery. Right? Because if your belly is tight and if your liver is big and it's in the way, then I'm going to be struggling and sweating on the day of your surgery. And it just makes sense. You don't want me sweating on the day of your surgery. Right? Because if I'm sweating, your risk is up. So we're going to work together on that. Now what about the liver? All right, look at my diagram and you'll see that the liver sits right on top of the stomach in the area where we need to go surgically to create that tiny little stomach pouch. And this actually applies to all three operations, the same situation. So everybody who is a, is a candidate for this operation has a big liver. That's a fact of life because the liver is part of the fat storage system. That's the bad news. The question is, how big is your liver? If it's a medium liver or a mildly enlarged liver, well, we can work with that. That's what we're accustomed to. But some people have an absolutely huge liver and if it is a huge liver, we'd rather find that before surgery, which we can, identify it, get it reduced by having you lose weight, and then have a surgery that goes smoothly and is complete and is secure. Now, why is it that weight loss helps the liver? The cool thing is that the liver is the main transit point or switching station for energy in your body. So if you're taking in excess calories and you're storing energy, that weight goes into the liver first and then gets redistributed out to the rest of your body. 
The flip side, which helps us, is also true. So if you're losing weight by eating very little, your body is burning extra energy, okay, fat burning mode. The cool thing is that that weight is going to come out of your liver first. So especially in the two weeks leading up to surgery, for you to really bear down and just eat very little. Dr. Rice likes to say the chicken and water diet. But whatever you do, eat very little, especially in that last two weeks. That's going to help us and it's going to help you a lot as you get ready for the surgery. Okay? So I hope I've convinced you that losing some weight is reasonable and it does matter. This is the picture of a very enlarged liver uh, that we're looking at laparoscopically. And if you look at this, you can see there's just a tiny little bit of stomach poking out from the edge of the stomach. A um, tiny little stomach, bit of stomach poking out from the edge of the liver. And this is an unhappy surgeon, an unhappy patient. Now we got that operation done, but it was a struggle. Okay, now look at this diagram. This is a patient that's lost some weight prior to the surgery. And we've got our simple rod retractor lifting the liver up out of the way. And we can easily see up to the top end of the stomach where we need to operate. And this is a surgery that's gonna go very well. And this is where the patient gets credit for preparing themselves for surgery and decreasing their own risk. By this time in the talk, a lot of you have decided, yeah, this all kind of makes sense and I'm ready to do the surgery. And by the way, not only am I ready to do the surgery, but I want to get on with it and I want to do it tomorrow. What happens next? Well, unfortunately, this is where I need to talk about insurance some. Believe it or not, your health insurance company is usually not in favor of you having this surgery. That sounds crazy, right? But here's the situation. It's about the money, okay? This operation takes about three years or four years to make the money back. And it makes the money back in terms of less medication cost, less chance of hospitalization for heart failure or diabetes or something like that. But of course the surgery itself costs something just on the high side of $20,000. And if the insurance company has you on their rolls for about a year or 18 months, which guess what guys, that's the average. If you're only on the rolls for a short time, they say, well, that doesn't make sense financially. Okay. Now, it's an interesting side discussion that that whole question doesn't get asked as it relates to lung cancer treatment or breast cancer treatment or treatment for diabetes or trauma th therapy. The cost never comes into it. Okay. What we're dealing with is also a prejudice question, but let's talk about cost for a second. This is where they're coming from. Now, because of that, the insurance companies are going to find ways to slow you down and stop you from getting into the surgery. And it's very common these days that the insurance company is going to require a six-month diet to go through before surgery. Now, all of you have been through six-month diets, okay? But they're going to want their own six-month diet. They're going to want you to start over and be under the uh, supervision of a doctor and show up on exactly monthly intervals and show that you can be there and comply with that treatment over an extended period. And I just want to tell you guys that that is just a test coming from the insurance company, a hurdle that they want to make you jump to see if you'll do it and go into surgery. And they know that 20 or 30 percent of people will drop out in that process and they consider that a win. Crazy. Okay, so part one, I want you to know that that whole thing is coming from the insurance company and not from us, your docs, and not from our staff either. So if you want to get pissed, which I encourage you to do, then call the insurance company. Now, what about that? I don't think that the rationale for this six month diet is really very strong. Um, I've just attended our annual conference and it's medically demonstrated that there is not any helpful impact on a timed diet required by insurance. The only impact of it is counterproductive. In fact, a person with a body mass index of 40 is living with twice the risk every day of sudden death caused by their weight. Okay, remember that Greek story with the sword hanging over the guy's head? Damocles, the sword of Damocles. It's like you've got a sword of Damocles over your head caused by the weight. So in essence, what the insurance company is saying is Mrs. Jones, you have to live with this weight for six more months just because we said so. And there's no medical benefit to it. So we as surgeons all across Texas and we encourage all of you as patients right now to start standing up and getting a little angry and becoming appropriately entitled to demand the health care that you are paying for. Because you are paying for this, by the way, whether it's you directly or your employer or your spouse's employer or just you as a consumer, 
we're all paying health insurance costs, okay? And that's fine, we should. That's what health insurance is for. But we should get back the health care that we expect out of that, okay? So I really encourage you as an individual patient and you and you and everybody to call the insurance company and ask them this question, what's the medical justification for this diet plan? Okay, and I want you to ask a very specific question. It's not show me your policy, okay, because they can make up whatever policy they want. It's not against the law. You want to ask what's the medical justification because in theory, they're working for your medical benefit. You want them to be in the spot of proving it, right? And now, this is not going to change anything if it's one patient once a year. But I really believe if more patients and more docs get more active in this, maybe a little bit of media publicity and things like that that we'll be working on, then um, you know, it's going to be a powerful force for change. And so please do get yourself motivated and activated in this process. So I really appreciate your sitting and listening to me tonight. Um, many people are still kind of in the decision process for the surgery at this point in time. And I want to say a couple things in closing. Uh, first of all, the medical decision process about qualifying for surgery, qualifying for surgery, is pretty simple. It's math. And it's just two things. Are you in the weight criteria? And are you at a person, are you a person who is at an acceptable risk that we could get through surgery? If those two things are yes, then my partners and I are going to work with you and work for you to help get you for surgery. The other part of the decision process, your homework for now, is to think in your own heart. Are you ready? Is this a necessary change for you? Okay, and if you feel like you're at that last straw position where you need to have this surgery to live longer, you, to be around for your kids, for example, or to be able to walk from your living room to the car more easily, um, if you feel that you need it and you've done everything else that you can do, then I encourage you to call and, and attend one of these seminars or start working through our process. Now, I want to warn you that as you're going through this process, people are going to accuse you of taking the easy way out or being lazy. And, you know, I just believe that that's so far from the truth. People who think actively about this surgery and, and look at their life, not just over the next week, but over the next five years and 10 years, and see where they're going and courageously and intelligently intervene on that by choosing surgery and choosing all the commitments and changes and follow-up that go with it, okay, you are making a smart and brave decision that does take a lot of work, but it's work that's much more likely to be successful than the work that you've done in the past. So thank you very much. For more information, please call or visit our website 